sure that's right. That is right. <clears throat> Make sure that's a bit clearer. That's a bit clearer. Pop out video. My name's Matt, welcome back to the shop. And this is actually a treat. So, um, Driving for Answers did a video a uh, while back, two years, he says, uh, about Alpha Dan. We'll get into that in a bit. So what's happening now is that he's done a video about the Scotch York engine, and uh, uh, and I'm going to tear it to bits. But let me just say, right, um, it's nice that someone doesn't ignore things that have been said. I do like that. Um, there is I've, I've literally skimmed through this bit. Someone sent me the link and then said this bit. So I literally watched a minute of the middle. I say it's the middle. It's literally is about this eight minutes on to about I don't know ten minutes or maybe two minutes. And I thought, right, I'm going to stop because I want to. And then I just skimmed, yeah, skimmed, yeah, skimmed, yeah. So I want to actually go through the entire thing as it goes. Um, and I've prepared a few tabs because I know some things that are going to come up. So I just went right. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. So I might not use all of these tabs and slides and stuff. So basically, we've just got some stuff right to talk about things um i might have to go digging I i've tried to be prepared i could sit here and watch this but i don't think you're going to get the best reaction so this video has had 157,000 views let's see how much of that is right and let's see how much of this video people watch it's quite interesting bugger all i bet you this engine is better in every way than a conventional reciprocating piston engine. Right, that is a broad claim. So it is better than a, conve a normal engine. It is better than a normal engine in every way. There best not be a section in this where you say it's got issues. Because you just said every way. It's more efficient. It makes more power. Ooh, right. right. And it even has much better engine. We've got to actually make this big. Engine balance. First up, the efficiency. Now, oh, engine balance as well. <laughs> right, go on. Now, in a conventional engine, when combustion occurs, the rod is at an angle. Of the four strokes, the combustion stroke is the stroke which creates by far the highest load on the engine. And um, that's a... Right, so <laughs> this is a phone, right? And we call this a phone, really. It's a battery, screen, CPU, motherboard, speaker, jack, buttons, camera, all sorts. Memory, you name it. But we call this a phone, right? So an engine is the same thing. It's an assembly of parts. And we put load on the engine. The engine is what turns fuel, basically it converts one kind of energy into another kind of energy. Chemical is stored energy in your fuel and it converts it to motion, right? And you can put load on that engine. Load, you wouldn't say is like, what's he say? Let's get it the right. Combustion stroke is the stroke which creates by far the highest load on the engine. But no, because the engine is there to extract that energy. For instance, you can have an engine just freewheel, right? You can have it in neutral and you can just have an engine freewheel. There is no load on that engine. You wouldn't call the parasitic losses load. You just call them losses, right? Or forces. The engine is designed that the, all the bits in there are designed to take that. That's what they do is they extract that. So you wouldn't call that load on. It's just a weird way of saying it, but whatever. And it transfers this load vertically through the vertically moving piston onto an angled connecting rod. Right. So this load is actually trying to flip the rod over. It's fixed, so it's not try. It's not trying to do anything. As the rod tries to do this, it ends up pushing the piston harder into the cell. <laughs> I see what you're getting at. Hmm. It's resistance. It's actually the rod that's resisting the motion, but they don't do this. I'll explain in a minute why. There is this, but it's not as simple as it makes out, and I'll show you. Under wall, and this reduces efficiency. It reduces efficiency because it increases friction, and friction yeah. is wasted energy because less of the energy created by combustion now gets to be turned into useful work. 
a part of it is wasted on friction. The other so what we need here is the amount. That's what we need. Because we need he's going to say a Scotch York engine versus a conventional engine, we need to know because it'd be like saying my car's lighter than yours. Why? How much lighter? And you're bragging about how much it's lighter. It's just lighter. You don't understand. It's a V6 and you've got a straight four and mine's just lighter. Like, what are you on about? Because you took the carpets out. Uh, right. Well, so with one, you've just taken something out. But number two is we're talking fuck all. When we're talking about we are comparing an apple to an orange, and you can do that, right? You can compare them both, right? You've got to compare, well, the acidity, the size, uh, ease of access, the nutritional value. You can give the numbers. If you just couldn't turn around and say, oranges are more acidic, is that a good thing? How much more? Which apples? Which oranges? You get what I mean? The problem this creates is that it creates uneven wear in the engine cylinders. But yeah, but over what time period? Because of this, one side of the cylinder always wears more than the other over a period of many, many miles. I do think, find it funny that he showed you a liner. That's a cylinder liner which I designed to be replaced. Now, we can sort of fix this in a convention. What did he say there? Sorry, I think I missed Because of this, one side of the cylinder always wears more than the other over a period of many, many miles. Yeah, but that many, many, many miles can be 200,000. Are we really complaining about that? So, are you going to pick... Are you going to say a Scotch York is better because of that? And is it? This is the thing. Now, we can sort of fix this in a conventional design by offsetting the cylinder center from the crankshaft center. So, this is called the Saxon cylinders. Basically, it means if you look down your cylinder, you can see your crank pin. But if you move the cylinder over, and what you do is, what he needs to be careful about here is that even you you decrease it in one direction. So as you can see, as the, the, the rod has stood up more, you decrease it in one direction. As the piston comes round this side, the angle's less. But when you go the other side, it's actually increased. The Saxon doesn't give you everything that you want. It actually increases it in one way. The reason why you desax a cylinder, and we're only talking slightly, I know he's exaggerated, it's to show it, but the reason why you do that is because you've got a bias in strokes. So you've got your combustion stroke, and then you've got, you know, your exhaust stroke, your intake, and you, you know, well, your power stroke, your exhaust stroke, your intake stroke, right? And when you offset that, you can say, right, well, this stroke has just a higher force involved, your power stroke, right, where your exhaust stroke and your intake stroke and your compression stroke, you can bias it. So every downstroke is that uh, there's less load on the sidewall. And then obviously on every upstroke, it's actually increased. But if your downstroke, one downstroke is your combustion stroke then you can offset that slightly we're only talking slightly on margins we're talking about i think it's one and a half percent is the most you can get reduction this does improve efficiency because it reduces the rod angle but it's a compromise and only a partial you see this is what we're talking about efficiency you say efficiency but you've got to say which efficiency so if you do this with this rod built malarkey here what you're doing is you're make so the greatest mechanical advantage, so the greatest crank angle, is around about 70, 75 degrees, and that changes, that angle changes depending on what engine you've got, right? Bore and stroke ratio, stuff like that. But let's just say it's 75 degrees, right? 75 degrees, I'm going to have to get my crayons out now. 75 degrees is, oh my God, what's going on here? So you'll have your crank, your big end, and your small end, like this. 75 degrees, and I don't know what that's 90, so I'm about there. <laughs> right, that angle there, right, you can see it's about 90, it's almost 90. And this is the crank angle is 75 degrees. This is your greatest mechanical advantage. Now, if you do what he's done there, where you can desax your cylinders, what you can do is make sure that everything's the same. Your stroke length is actually, we should just copy that over. Move that over there, copy that, paste it again. 
But what I'm going to do instead is move this so your cylinder's offset. If we now do this, and it's easy to see what we've done. If we now, why is that not that on orange? There we go. Now what you've done is you can see that our angle is greater than 90 degrees. Oops. Our angle is greater than 90 degrees. And it actually means that the best mechanical advantage happens at a different angle. And it, it sweeps through a different angle as well, right? It can give you, if you set it up right away, I've just guessed here. If you set it up right, it can give you, in a sense, more of a straight shot. So you're pushing more down instead of deflecting off at an angle, right? Now, that is what gives you, that's mechanical efficiency. That's not fuel efficiency. It can be related, but that's mechanical efficiency. You've got to be careful about what you say mechanical efficiency-wise because there are also mechanical losses, which is friction, right? So you've reduced it there, but on your upstroke on the other way, you might get, at higher friction and so on and so forth. But this is what you can do. You can disaxis cylinders, you can offset wrist pins, you can do little things to squeeze out little bits. Solution. It's a compromise because it the other problem is is when you do this, you're offset your cylinder, it means that your balances are a bit skew iffy because your counterbalance is now not in line with your piston. So you got this out of plane thing, so you get some weird little harmonics complicates uh, engine balance it makes it harder to fix and it's only a partial solution yeah i said it, it complicates engine balance. because a large chunk of the friction still remains but in our unconventional engine this problem is almost right so let's just talk about before he goes on let's talk about what he's talking about so which one was it which one was it there we go so this is out of all of the losses. Can I zoom in? Oh, bloody. What the hell is that? Add-on manager. No, I don't need that. Um, let's zoom in a minute so it's easier to see. So there we go. So this is all of the losses. This is the showing friction losses in a gasoline engine with the proportion share of the piston rings. So you can see here, out of all of this, gas exchange, which is pumping losses, 3%. Cooling heat transfer to your cooling system. It's 24%. Exhaust heat losses, just pissing out straight out of your exhaust, is 26%. So as you can see straight away, this bit here, right down the middle, 50, more than 50%, is just moving, moving heat, right? That's all that is. It's just lost. Bang. See you later. So it says here, the useful energy we can actually pull out is 30%. That's been generous, but yeah. And then in here, the friction losses. And auxiliary dr valves, drives, and auxiliaries, so oil pumps, that kind of stuff. Bearings, 4%. Rings, 4%. Piston, 3%. Right? And you can see your rings there, how much your rings take in friction-wise. And this is actually from a study where they go through and actually do... I think I did download this one. Did I download the full text? I think I did. Um, view publication. This is not just a pretty picture they've drawn, right? This is a tribology thing where they go through absolutely everything and look at the study in and the blah, 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 and do dry runs and all this stuff. Uh, PDF. Have we got the PDF? I just want to show you the whole thing. Just open it. It does this thing where it pretends that... There we go. Um, but, yeah, so this is a full study here, look, where they go through everything. They show their workings, right? They look at the grain structure. This is all tribology stuff. And then they go through all this. And just basically assist cylinder and piston wear. And classical pistons and with tribology pads. The differences that all these things make. So they try and they'll probably tell you where they get this from actually. Where did they get this from as a source? Oh. So they'll have just got this number two. So we go down to resources. Acknowledgement. So this is from, well, it's a German paper, 2012, and it's about piston ring coatings. So this is how you find this stuff out, right? If you ever wanted to know how you find this stuff out, you can go and find these papers. Uh, this is DLC coatings, that's not the right one. But the, these papers, right, they go on forever. Right? <laughs> you can go down a rabbit hole. 
Anyway, they've got that from somewhere who's done the study, and they give you the source for who does the study. So I believe this. There's no really, It sounds right. It sounds in line with whatever. So we're talking about 3% of the entire system. Now, let's just say you've got an engine that produces, I don't know, let's just say 100 horsepower. So 100 horsepower, and then let's just say this is 33% efficient. So that would be three, the engine creates 300 horsepower. It just loses most of it. So 100 horsepower, it's actually a 300 horsepower engine. So 3% is 9 horsepower. So from a 100 horsepower engine, you're going to lose 9, right, in the piston. But we're not talking about recovering it all, are we? We're talking about recovering a bit, and we'll get to that, because that's quite interesting. Um, but anyway, we'll carry on. Non-existent, because the rod oh, oh, is... Oh, 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 right, 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 so this is fun. Jin, this problem is almost non-existent. That's bollocks. Sorry, but that is bollocks. Right, so what matters is the actual forces um, that are involved. Before he moves on and talks about all this kind of rubbish, we actually have to see what they are. So I've got this, which is the comparative study on friction behaviour of a bore piston interface and the technologies related to. In this, they've actually taken some direct measurements there. So they've actually taken some measurements. You'll notice two things, right? This is crank angle in degrees. So you can see when we get to TDC, right? And basically you have zero and then you have a negative and a positive number. Right, and you've got simulations and measured. Right, so the simulations are in black. Let's see if I can zoom in. Actually, let's just zoom in so everyone can see. There we go. So the black line is the measure uh, simulated, and the red line is the measured. So this is friction force at two thousand five hundred RPM, uh, eight hundred kilopascals um, pre cylinder pressure, basically. So you'll notice two things, right? That on which one we're going to say that will be the power stroke, I imagine, and that'll be the yeah. So we've got oh, what is that? Oh, we don't, yeah, it, this is the power stroke, obviously, because we've got the biggest ones. So you'll notice we've got power stroke, compression stroke, intake. So the intake stroke, right, just going down the bore, right, uh, and this is for cast iron cylinder liners, you can see that. We go down to about 50 newtons. So against one wall, 50 newtons. But you'll notice that it does this. You see how it rattles. And you can see from the simulation that it's greatest at the top because we're the greatest from our arm. There's the biggest amount of deflection. And then when we're down in the bottom, down at the bottom of the ball, everything's a bit more compact and stiffer. Um, and you're not being as thrust as far away, you're, you're down in the bowels kind of thing, and there's also the oil splashing around and resistance and stuff and all sorts of things. So down here, it's a lot more lubricated, so it rattles less. But you can see that the piston rattles, you know, with force and then off the force and force and off the force, and there's an oscillation to this. So it's rattling down the bore, right? Once it gets to the bottom, and then as soon as you start changing direction, you get a... You get a flip right which is this bit and then you go up the bar and you rattle up the bar and as you go further away from the stiffness of the crank you basically just start to fucking increase your forces again but we've got what 50 there now that weirdly enough the simulated reckons it was going to be a lot lot higher like literally nearly twice as high you know if this is what 60 that's nearly 120 and then combustion happens so it goes whack up back 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 so this is like a giant it whacks it bounces and then again and then whatever as cylinder pressures in basically as it starts to get moving and then it does all mannerisms of crazy shit but what's weird is the simulation actually did plot this this jump and bounce and then we're back again but if we actually look at the actual forces it's a hundred this way and a hundred this way now this is only for 200 2500 rpm right 50 newtons. So if you get if you get your 50 if you get your 50 newtons and you divide that by 9.8, right? That's five kilos divided by 10. It's five kilos. I can put five kilos on an egg. It's, it, it's not a lot. That's how much force it is. The acceleration of, of when you put when you put five kilos on something, that is the force. 
That is the force against your cylinder wall. Get get a, a, a cylinder of anything, cut it in half, put some scales between it, little scales, and then put a piston on top of it and push with five kilos you go. Go, is that it? That's it. Now that's that's force and that's friction, right? But a lot of the times you'll be floating just on a little pool of water. The the ring friction is higher. You know, as we saw from that other one, the ring friction is higher. It's like, oh Jesus Christ. So that's that one. So we're talking bugger all. Number two is, if you just look at this system, right, before he yabs on, this can slide this way. This can slide this way. So it, the whole thing can move, and it'll rattle down the ball like this. So this is quite heavy. This is heavier than this. And that actually brings me on to another thing. Before it, I'm going to jump the gun here. If you actually look at these engines... Right, there's a good one here. I don't know who built this. This is I don't think this is a Bork engine. This looks far too modern. That's heavy. That's heavy. You don't need or this needs to be this size. If you've got two pistons or not, it needs to be bulky. It's huge. Look at the size of this. What you don't think that weigh that weighs anything? And this is on um, some slide bearings, and it's basically free to rattle around. Like the crank pin is where the crank pin is, but this can move. It's the, actually the pistons that are stopping that lateral movement. There you go. So there's going to be some forces there. Now, they're going to be lower than this. I'm not denying that. But we're talking not that much in the grand scheme of things. So is it better? In that one, if you look at that one specific thing, yes. If we just look at that piston side to get friction, yes. Has it got more inertial mass? And the thing is, you say, is it? Because the thing is, I've never tested one of these, so maybe it is. Maybe it does rattle around. Maybe slugging around this mass can create a lot of force. You get weird oscillations and stuff at different speeds. Who knows? No one's tested it. Well, they, they usually wreck them. <laughs> I'll give you a clue. They wreck themselves before anyone actually manages to test one of these properly. Because the rod is never at an angle and now the vertical load of the combustion transferred to the vertically moving piston is also vertically transferred onto the ah now when you apply a, a, a force directly through rod, here, which... like this this is offset from that you see how this works right so your center of mass is say there you're applying a thrust through that well, that's not where this is. So this is going to resist moving. So doesn't that rot? It does rotate. And then when this rotates, it skids there and skids there. If it rotates anti-clockwise from the way we're looking at it. Oh, yeah. Well, these try and keep this. This block tries to keep that as stiff as possible. But the fact of the matter is, is this block is rotating on a bearing around this pin. So we're just hoping for dear God that that does that. But there is a bit of twist there. It's also always moving vertically. The effect of trying to flip the rod over isn't... So, in other, in other words, if we go back to our drawing here, our, our really crude drawing, and we just do our... We just do what he did, right? You just get this like this, and we just have a rod. We'll just keep it simple. Just have a rod like this. Your force is coming straight down here, right, like that. And let's just say your centre of mass, we'll do it, we'll do it, we'll do it. Your centre of mass for this whole assembly, for this rod, oh, is there. This is like a seminar, so you're just going to have to bear with me. Right, we'll do that, just for the, the gigs. You do that, but your pin thing, your crank pin, is over here. I don't know why that's yellow. I do know that's yellow. Right, so that is what needs to be pushed. Well, that's going to resist being moved that way. Here's your centre of mass. Oh, it's trying to flip it. Right, that, that's what we call a torque. That's a torque arm, right? From this point here to there, that's what we call a torque arm. This angle, right? So it's going to cause it to rotate that way, that way around. Oh. Oh well. 
much less pronounced and therefore friction is greatly reduced. Piston friction, maybe. We don't know now because this isn't as clean cut as you seem to think it is. We can do this because we have now incorporated the entire side to side horizontal range of motion of the big end of the rod into the big end itself, which means that the rod never has to assume any angle. Now the great just because it doesn't have to theoretically doesn't mean it won't in practice. The thing about this is that because the, both the rod and the piston are now moving vertically in the same way, we can make them as one single part. We can get rid of the wrist pin, which means that we get rid of the friction between the piston and the wrist pin and the rod. And right, do you know how low that friction is? This is a this is a really you can tell how low friction is on some components by how well they are oiled so a crankshaft has a high pressure oil feed system with this and the other now some rods are drilled through and they have but most times now we've got better materials where we just don't even have to bother this further improves uh, i'll tell you what i've got a rod i came prepared so this is a big rod from a dragster and if you look right, it is for a dragster but a lot of rods are like this this is an aluminium rod if you look, there's nothing there. There's no brass, there's no bronze bushing, there's nothing. Just a little pissy little wee pole. On this side, right, there is a cap. And actually, these are pretty special, right? Um, but they have bearings there that then have an oil feed that goes through the crank to directly feed hydrodynamic bearings, right? Well, you can see where most of the load ends up going. This is just nodding slightly. It's not really, you know, it's literally... A lot of engines, it's literally just doing this. It's just doing that. It, it, there's not much going on here, right? It's not much movement. It's like headstock bearings on a motorbike, right? Not much is going on really. It just, it just, it's all in compression, and it, the material itself. There's actually so little force. Not little forces, but there's so little friction wear really going on here um, that they make them hollow. <laughs> efficiency it also improves strength and reliability because we're reducing the number of moving parts next up power now we have to ask ourselves how does a different rotating assembly anatomy even increase power well it oh yes well I, i'm let me I'm, I'm just gonna put it out there i'm sure you're gonna get this wrong does this by buying more time for the engine to harness the energy of combustion Ooh, I didn't think it was going to go with that one, but we'll see. This even increases efficiency at high RPM, where the window for harnessing combustion energy becomes increasingly small. So, mm, I think you, you've got this wrong. All right, cool. Go on. Now we have to ask ourselves, how does a different rotating assembly anatomy increase the time? For yeah, I know where it's going. For harnessing combustion energy, it does this by not pulling the piston down faster than that. Yeah, right. So number one is the pistons are pushed down. Fuck's it, he's done this before. The only time pistons are dragged down is when you're off the throttle and the engine is running faster than any kind of energy that's been produced, right? Uh, released, sorry, not produced. So it is, it, people make this mistake all the time because they sit there and they just play with these little computer models and don't actually think what's going on. The pressure inside the cylinder is pushing it down, it doesn't run away. If this piston is here, it's because it's been forced there, not because it's run away. Necessary. <sighs> now, as you can plainly see in our conventional engine, the connect... And you, 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 you cab drawings are terrible. This crank pin isn't in the middle of the crank. Thing rod transition. You've done this before. What was that video you did before? This is getting a bit bitchy, but yeah, it, it makes me laugh. Um, if you're going to do videos about this kind of stuff, try and get the very basics right. Oh, it's rod ratio. It's rod ratio thumbnail. Uh, driving for answers. Spelt wrong. Yeah, this. <laughs> that's really funny. This. So that's not where that goes. It goes in the middle there. These are your counterweights. It's just bad, isn't it? It's same thing here. Same thing there. Look, you see, you're in the wrong place. And I know people are going to say that's petty. It probably is. But, um, yeah, your, your CAD models are... Actually, are they all that bad? Oh, that's a bit different. But the, the, they are bad. It's lazy. It's bad. It's lazy. I would, you wouldn't catch me ever doing anything like that. That's just... Oh, look, look. It done properly. Look, wow. 
It's crazy. Uh, if you're going to do it, do it right, if you can. You know what I mean? Any road. ...from fully upright to fully angled when we rotate from 0 to 90 degrees. This means that the rod is effectively becoming shorter in relation to the piston. Oh god, geometry is not that difficult. And the crankshaft, by becoming shorter, it pulls down the piston by an additional little distance. It doesn't pull, it's forced. Jesus Christ. And this distance equals the difference in height or length between the rod fully upright and the rod fully angled. And here, if you watch closely, you can clearly observe how the rod and right, so we're talking about sinusoidal motion. angling interferes with the piston motion. It creates what do you mean it interferes. It doesn't interfere. It's an additional little acceleration which pulls down the piston faster from it doesn't pull. Jesus Christ! On top that center. What it means is that the relation between the cylinder volume as a percentage versus your angle, your rotational percentage. So we say top dead centre to bottom dead centre. We'll say 0 to 100% a stroke. And then we say cylinder volume, 0, 100%, right, fully swept. If you go 50% the cylinder volume, that isn't 50% the crank angle, which is actually, weirdly enough, beneficial if you bias it one way. And luckily enough, it's biased one way. In other words, what we want, right, is we want the smallest volume we can get. So get rid of that. We want, let's just draw a cylinder, right, and then we're going to draw two cylinders. We want cylinder one here and cylinder two. You've got two options, right? When our crank angle is at our optimum, so there's our center, there's this at that, I was telling you about that 71, 75 degrees, right we can have two things we can have this one or we can have this where this is at 90 degrees right? and this is pulled down even well we'll just leave that we'll just say it's a sinusoidal jobby right so this is here at 70 degrees which means our crank angles at 90 uh, uh, sorry our rod to crank relationship is 90 which means peak torque right and then we've got this thing going on. Now, what we want, right, is we want this volume to be as small as possible, right, when this happens. We don't want it to be 50%, right? It's that simple. And the reason why is this. When a cylinder, the smaller the volume of a cylinder is during its swept volume, the higher the pressures. If you get that cylinder like a syringe and squish it, it's higher pressures. So we want the pressure, the force, forcing against our piston here, the highest when we're here. We don't want 50% of our volume for 50% of our crank angle, because uh, for 50% crank angle, because we're now past our greatest leverage is our greatest leverage is there. We've passed it. We've gone past it. You know, when you get like a, a spanner and you're trying to turn this and you push down like that and nothing happens and then you get here and it's easy to push and then you get here, that is your greatest. When you're perpendicular, you can apply the most torque to something. When it's past here, when you've run out of your reach, right, or just the angle is wrong, the angle of the dangle is wrong, right, we're past it, look. We don't want to be at 90 degrees. We just don't. And actually, if this is following suit and it's all the way down here, it's even more acute. It's terrible. We don't want that. What This is what we want, and we want the smallest volume when this happens. So this is actually wrong. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Now, in our unconventional engine, as you have seen, the connecting rod never angles. It, it doesn't matter where the rod is. Right, apart from that angle, right, that angle is what matters. This angle of how far are we from? Because when we're like this, we're going bang, and it's going straight through the crank, and nothing's happening, nothing's turning. We want it 90 degrees, right? And we're going to sweep through zero, 90, you know, 180. We're going to sweep through all of that, right? That's just what's going to happen. You can see it with this crank arm and this setup here. It's always a fully. 
So look, Vertical. there, you can see. You can literally go through Which your, means that it... your own drawing. There, nothing happens. Let's have to go back a tiny bit so we get a bit of this. And conventional engine, so as you, can you have see, seen. There, right? There, nothing's happening. And he's even got the arrows. Look, you can see the torque. This is his torque. The connecting here. rod. Torque is greatest there. Look at that. You, you, it even shows you. Put some numbers on E. You can graph this out. Well, you are graphing this out. But you put some numbers on E, it'll show you. Right? This angle, we can actually go back. Where's his greatest torque? It's so funny it's done on graph paper. <laughs> Alright, we're going right. Away. right, so the greatest torque. So we haven't got sorry, we haven't got any markers here showing you your, where your actual piston is. But your greatest torque is not at this 90 degrees, right? Here... Rod never angles. It's always... A fully vertical. Actually, that's weird, because you've, no, you've got no arrows vertical, here. Which means that it do shame, doesn't compare. pull down the piston. Maybe it does, but it's just not showing that. any faster. In other words... You see, this has been pushed. It's, these are on motors. They've not been driven by electrical motors. It's, it increases piston dwell time. You, sh you do this again, but show me cylinder pressures. So show me the cylinder pressure of this versus this. Because this is the thing, right? That it doesn't pull down the piston any faster. So there, right, what is our crank angle on these two these two things here? Because if we're still pissing around, right, then it doesn't matter. In other matter. words, it increases piston dwell time in the area around top dead center. And this is the area where peak combustion pressure builds. Mm. All right. Peak combustion, com, <laughs> peak combustion pressure builds. It is directly related to the temperature. Now, dwell. What does dwell have to do with anything? Dwell does two things. And with technology nowadays, dwell actually only really does one thing. So if you have a piston that comes up like this and hangs around for ages as the, the rod is rocking around like this, but nothing's actually happening, or it just dwells because it's one of these stupid things, right? What happens is you maintain that volume for a bit longer and you can have more complete combustion. This was beneficial back in the day when we had crappy fuels, especially like the World War eras where um, the, 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 the specification of your fuel was a bit all over the place, right? Quality of fuel was a bit all over the place, right? Because it means you get to combust everything. Now that we're using fuel injection better quality fuels with more additives and stuff that do help these kinds of things right just better quality everything now we've got that that really doesn't matter too much now i know people are going to say well it's burn times but as your piston goes back down it's still burning which actually keeps the pressure up it maintains it all you do not want and this is why we don't want an explosion this is why detonation is bad you do not want all that fuel to combust instantly there and then right because if you do that that's it. Your peak pressures, and it's all downhill from there, right? Because you're at that locking point, right? You're at bang. You don't want it there, so you want it to burn as it goes through. This is what diesels do. They have multi-fire, and this is what some pet direct injection petrols do. They've got multi-fire injection points to keep that pressure maintained to try and make more power. Regardless, you push that piston down, right? So what Re the real benefit of having dwell is this. When you pull your piston down, it dwells at the bottom as well. So you sit at the bottom with full volume, which allows the cylinder to fill with inertial filling completely. And then to make the most of this, you change your valve time in a bit. Right? So it goes, pulls a syringe and allows it to sit there before it starts going back up again. Because you've got to remember, these things are happening really fast. Right? You know, if it's 10,000 RPM, it's 166 times a second. It's a lot, right? So the burning is always ahead. People seem to think that pistons can run away from flame fronts, right? The flame front isn't the problem, it's the pressure. And your usual gasoline flame fronts are about 20 meters per second, which is bloody fast for such a small volume, right? So regardless... Um, the real benefit is you get to fill your cylinder just a bit better. That's the benefit of it, right? And if you dwell as well when you're on your exhaust stroke, you dwell and just make sure that it basically all gets pushed out. 
you can do that. You can have better overlap. That's where the benefit comes from, from having this dwell. Bye. It's got nothing to do with burning fuel in your cylinder. It's nonsense. Because these engines were always designed for low, for, um, you know, low speed. These were big chugging engines. And that's great because inertial filling is really what you want at low RPM because you get low torque performance. Keeping the piston longer here, we allow more energy of the combustion to be transferred onto the piston. Oh, 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 oh right. So, <laughs> you've been a dick. So, what energy? So, in your fuel is chemical energy. We then react that with air and it combusts. And then what comes out of that chemical energy gets converted into thermal energy. We just call that heat. So, we've got this heat, right? What does that heat do? If that piston sits there for longer, it just heats up the engine, it heats up the piston for longer. What it does is it heats up all the, all the molecules. So basically your exhaust gases are what push engines. Um, it heats up all the molecules that are in there. It's actually them that are doing the vibrating and liberating energy. So it's them that are heating themselves to a degree, if you get what I mean. That chemical energy that's stored in the bonds has now turned into basically runaway. It's waste heat as far as they're concerned. That then is converted, your piston converts any of the pressure in the cylinder, or your engine converts pressure in the cylinder into accelerating a piston, right? And it's momentum transfer. All of the molecules go bang, 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 and they hit and bounce off, and it's a momentum transfer. So if they sit there and nudge it, so you imagine you sit there and nudge it, and it's not moving... Do you know what that is? That's wasted, right? All you're doing is imagine that's your crank, your, your crank bearing. You're just pushing the crank down into its bearing through the rod. That's all you're doing. You're just squashing the piston assembly. You know, you're pistoning your rod. All you're doing is doing this for a bit longer. That's no, that's useless, right? That's useless. What will happen is, is that you'll just blow your cylinder head off, if you get what I mean. What you want is your piston to start accelerating. So if you sit there and everything's rotating below and your piston's not moving anywhere, that's crap mechanical efficiency. That's not good. You want your piston to start moving. And turned into useful work. No, you, see, you don't know what you're talking about. And finally, the balance. Why is the balance better in the unconventional engine? Again, it's because of the rod. It's always the rod. In the conventional engine, as we have seen... The no, you, you, the, you, so he did some videos about secondary balance and he seems to be in love with it and thinks it's the holy grail. It's not the holy grail at all. Second order imbalance is... Second order vibration is... It's a thing. It's a thing usually you just balance out with a balancer shaft. Job done. See you later. Angling of the rod pulls down the piston by an additional distance. The piston covers this distance with a changing speed or acceleration. This I'm sorry, say that again distance the piston covers this distance with a changing speed or acceleration this happens ah no this is called jerk <laughs> this is called jerk right probably something else that you haven't read in wikipedia yet so there's a rabbit hole for you uh jerk in engineering we've got jerk there we go in physics so jerk it's an acceleration of an acceleration right so, in physics, jerk or jolt is the rate in which an object's acceleration changes in respect to time. So, it's an acceleration of an acceleration. Uh, as a vector, it can be expressed as a first time derivative of acceleration, second time derivative of velocity, blah, blah, blah. So, it's basically, it's meters per second cubed, right? It's not something people usually use, and some people, eh, they kind of... They don't want to use it, right? It, again, it's something that happens in jerk. It, something that happens with camshaft. Oh, there we go. Camshafts. It's something that people who talk about cams, camshaft profiles talk about jerk a lot, right? And that's what he's talking about. So there you go. If you've learned anything from this video, it's that jerk or jolt, but jerk, I've never heard it called jolt. 
jerk is a real thing. That's because piston speed is always changing during engine operation. And obviously the piston also has a certain mass. But you see it's accelerating and then there's a change to that acceleration. So if we have acceleration and mass, this tells us that the angling of the rod creates a certain force. This force is known as a secondary force. It creates imbalances known as secondary imbalances. Oh, I love secondary imbalances. It's no one cares. Which cause problems for the engine because they increase engine vibrations. All conventional engine designs are subject to these vibrations and the only way to get rid of them is to rely on opposite secondary forces from other cylinders if they're present or to use balancing shafts to get rid of these vibrations. But as you... Do you know what? Do you know what? It works fine. People use balancing shafts or they just ignore it. Right? Or they use other ways to kind of mitigate the balance issues. You can... You can do things like you can create a slight imbalance in your primary imbalance to mask some of it. You can take a lot of it out because the problem is, is where imbalances cross over, right? So when they add together, they compound and become horrible. Seen in our unconventional engine design, the rod is always fully vertical. It's never angling, which means that we achieve something that a conventional design never could, and that is the complete elimination of secondary vibrations, even in single cylinder form, leading to a smoother running engine. Ah, but look at the size of this thing. So, as you can see with this bad, oh, let's not use this, we'll use this bad model. You've got a piston, right? And then you've got your counterbalances, which should be balanced, but they're not. Uh, <laughs> Right, so these two are opposing pistons, right? They're out of plane, but they balance each other out. This thing is a lot heavier. So your reciprocating masses, if you think about your reciprocating masses of this, so up and down, you've got the mass of the piston, the wrist pin, and half of the rod is what we say generally, right? Half of the rod, half of the piston. And the reason why we say it's half is because one's, one part of the rod, the small end is going up and down, even though it's doing this, it's going up and down, right? Where this one is just going like this, although it's doing this weird thing. So we say approximately half, right? This bit's going up and down, this bit's... So we say this is 100% reciprocal and this is 100% rota rotational. It's just the easiest ballpark stuff to do, right? Okay then, so we've got piston check, wrist pin check and half the rod check. This, we've got piston and this thing. Now, you, you might say, oh, we don't have a wrist pin. Do you not? Do you not? You don't have a bolt or anything, so how do you take this off? How do you manufacture this all as one? You don't, right? These are connected. Usually you have a bolt in it or two bolts or four bolts or something bolting these two together. So that's a wrist pin, right? <clears throat> there we go, wrist pin. So you've got the piston and all of this mass... Did I keep that picture up? Please say I kept that picture up. All of this mass in your primary. Now, you can balance. That's easier to balance. Well, I say easier to balance out. When it's like this, it's like, oh, my God. These things are slow revving. You see, do your research. It might help. In almost all relevant cylinder configurations. Now, our unconventional engine has a name, and it's called a Scotch yoke engine. No, it's not. It's not called a Scotch York engine. This is just what you call a Scotch York. This is a mechanical oh, arrangement, right? As I said, this is called a Scotch York. The guy who did this video missed out the engine bit because this isn't him. This is somebody else's video. A Scotch York is simply an alternative way of converting rotation into reciprocation and this design is not new at all. It was employed many times in the past on steam engines on... Oh look, so, look at the bloody size of it. <laughs> right, these are your rods. So imagine them being your rods. That's huge. <laughs> That's absolutely bloody huge. Here's your crank, right? There's your crank pin in this bronze block in these slide bushings, right? These are just basically just slide linear bearings kind of thing. So you just slide up and down, up and down, up and down. This is actually so heavy that it actually looks like it's got a bearing at the bottom as well and it slides across the bottom. Or it's actuating something else, which is quite often like this rod here usually actuates something else. as like another rod coming off it, look. But cylinder, rod, that's about right. You know, as size, the in that in internal bore of this to the rod, yeah, it's about right. Pistons in here, cool. Look at the bloody size of this thing. Now, yes, we can make things lighter and stuff, but if you look, it's got a main block, it's got the bearings, it's got the end blocks, and it's got some webs. So they've already gone out of the way to make this quite light. 
Uh, hot air engines as... Oh, look, someone's got here. <laughs> look at all these. This is it's, as you can see, it's archaic rubbish. As well as by a man called Russell Borg, who in the 20s experimented with the Scotch Oak design and he wanted to use it to improve existing two-stroke engines at the time. Yeah, look at the imbalance. So this mass, the rod, the yoke bit in the middle, this rod and the piston all go that way. This one goes up that way. If you And if you try and think, well, we'll just put them back so they'll just oppose each other, you have got a lot of mass doing this, which does this. Right, that's a lot of mass to balance out. It's a lot of, uh, which comes a lot of stress. He even made several working prototypes, but his design was never commercialized. Why? And this now brings us to the elephant in the room. If the Scotch Oak design is so much better, but it isn't so much better because half the things you've said are wrong. Then a conventional design. Then why do all of our vehicles, land, sea, and air, use a conventional rotating assembly instead of a Scotch Oak one? Well, this is because. The Scotch Oak creates two inherent problems. Whoa, 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 where are we? 617. Are you ready for this? Remember. This engine is better in every way than a conventional reciprocating piston engine. Oh, right. So now you've heard that. Let's hear the problems. For the engine. And the <sighs> culprit behind these two problems is... You guessed it. It's the rod. I told you. It's always the rod. The first problem the rod creates is weakness. Who did this model? What is this? This is, is this you? It is you, because they're terrible. What is this? That's not a crankshaft. It'll put some effort into it. Jesus Christ. This is, this is what gets me, right? Low effort videos, and then 157,000 subscribers, and then loads of people licking his ass. It's just, yeah, it's just, no, no. The second problem the rod creates is very complicated friction. No, you see, it's not weakness. Right. What happens is, is that you say that number one should be weight, like primary imbalance, because of the weight, the, the inertia of this entire thing. Right. Because you have to beef this up to take beef. You have to beef this up to take all the forces. Right. So that's number one. It's the the structure of the thing, not weakness. Your little pissy thing's weak, but no one would design this like this. You should have showed, should have shown this picture. Look at that beauty. What a beauty. Absolute gorgeous. Huge. The next one is friction. So he just wasted God knows how long talking about friction. And then this is the problem. The weakness is honestly pretty obvious if you just take a look at the rod. And as you can see, especially at the bottom, this long, thin... Also, these this weird blend you've got going here and these weird... You literally didn't try with this, did you, at all? In section, it's pretty obvious how even small loads could buckle or deform this thin, little, weak part of the rod. Number two, the sliding block in the rod that is sliding across the slot in the rod is relying on sliding friction to... It's not just that, it's that when you go bang and you force this whole thing down, it's just rubbing on one side. Then when it comes back around, it's rubbing on this side. And one of the problems with this is that this side is getting a lot more abuse because it's doing the compression stroke, and this side is getting a lot of abuse on the exhaust stroke, just due to piston acceleration. But one versus the other, this side is getting more abuse than this side. Ah keep working it's creating sliding friction actually and sliding friction by itself is not very desirable because it can be complicated oh like a piston in a bar and the weirdest thing is does he think that if you lay this thing flat that that cylinder with this good massive scotch oak it weighs a lot it's just going to not sit on the bottom of the cylinder do you think it doesn't rattle down the bar do you think it just floats what do you think piston rings do make it float inside an engine and it can cause many issues we really want to avoid sliding friction when possible now sliding friction by itself would be a issue that could be resolved it's the problem is is it's also it, like i say the whole thing tips right when you go out to this side there's a rotation there right the forces aren't aligned they're not countering properly number two is this sliding backwards and forwards there's an acceleration there with just this block right you slide this backwards and forwards like this that's all it does. There's a, an imbalance there that needs sorting out. No one cares, no. And because uh, this is a mass, right? This this is a mass, this block. Forget the pin. 
the pin rotates within it. This block, which has you know these bearings on it, is sliding backwards and forwards. And the thing is, if you go sliding backwards and forwards, and everything's dimensionally, you know, the the, the ugh, is dimensionally free to float around, then this is going to drag the other way, which means that the whole thing is going to do this. All right, as you push one way, there's going to be a reaction force, a reactionary force going the other way as it drags because of lubrication. The other thing is you can't lubricate this thing properly. You could have an oil feed that goes through here, through the crank pin that then bleeds out onto here, but it's, it's asymmetrical. So you've got, like I say, a lot more forces here than you have on this side. And then it's, it goes hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. It's just a mess. It's a mess. If it wasn't further made problematic by the fact that we're applying large combustion oats onto the sliding friction onto the block we're trying to push it into the surface as it's trying to slide through its range of motion this is the issue that rendered many prototypes in fact all prototypes of uh, early uh, scotch yoke engines useless because it caused very rapid wear and engine failure so hang about didn't we just talk about cylinders and pistons wearing out cylinders after many 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 miles that do uh, have got hundreds of millions of examples almost probably a billion examples out there in the real world ah oh. and if we go back remember this is better. back to the conventional design we can see how number one there is no sliding friction anywhere well yes there is you div <laughs> <laughs> right, so this is where we cross a line here where I get called a bit of an idiot in this, like, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. And you have just said there are no sliding frictions anywhere. Now, he doesn't know this picture's behind him, but this is why I don't do videos like this. This is why I do them on boards or I do them on the computer like we're doing now so I can see what I'm interacting with. Otherwise, you look like a dick. Design, we can see how, number one, there is no... Oh, we'll have to repeat that, just in case everyone didn't get that. So, if you think that, Matt, that's just his point of view and your point of view, and who says who's right, this is how. A scotch yoke engine's useless because it caused very rapid wear and engine failure. Th that's, that's proof in the real world, instead of a stupid YouTube video. And if we go back to the conventional design, we can see how, number one, there is no sliding friction anywhere. Now, you see, you could say there's no sliding friction, and you'd say, well, he's talking about the rod crankshaft interaction but you said anywhere uh, everything is round and it's just sort of revolving around each other nothing is sliding on anything and also the rod if we observe the rod we have a uniform circular design which is obviously much stronger than the long thin they say obviously but you need to explain to your audience why that's that's the case lot of the scotch yoke road however Yak rod, yoke rod, scotch yoke rod, scotch yoke rod. However, advancements in engineering, material science, and manufacturing and machining are now promising to make. Whoa, 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 whoa. That was just a lot of word salad. Scotch yoke rod, scotch yoke rod. However, advancements in engineering. What engineering? Material science. Material science is engineering. And manufacturing. Manufacturing is engineering. And machining. Machining is engineering. Are now promising to make it possible to resolve the inherent... Where is this person or where is engineering that's promising this? It's talking shit now. This is... This is... This is almost like an Alpha Dan pitch. <laughs> the issues of the scotch yoke design. Are they? What are they? Where are they? Can you show them any papers? Can you do what normal manufacturers do and publish stuff on this? And to make it commercially viable. We have things now like very, very, very accurate machining... We've had very, very accurate machining for a long, 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 long time. How do you think Spitfire engines were made? How do you think NASA got to the moon? That was in the 60s. What? We haven't got all of a sudden very, very accurate machining. The accuracy is about what you're willing to chuck away and how much attention you're willing to pay to something. Right? And what do you mean by accuracy? Do you mean batch building and tolerances? Do you mean yield? What do you mean by that? I'm guessing you don't know. Composite materials. Composite materials. It's one of these, yeah, it is one of these things. The future's here. Carbon fibre. <laughs> what do you... Uh, it's a good thing, actually. Right? People talk about super alloys, right? And 
composites and all this shite, right? Let me put it this way. What do you have that's titanium? And what do you have that is composite? The general person. You might have a titanium exhaust. It's a pipe. It's because it's light. It's not because it's some stupidly excellent material. It's a, a fad material. You might, and I will, I will say this, you might have a hip joint or a knee joint, or something, well, a hip joint, a hip joint that is titanium. Wonderful. Anything else? Maybe you've got a tooth insert um, that's a titanium. Maybe you have... Oh, titanium on your watch. Um, um, composites, right. Aramid or Kevlar or... Well, Aramid is Kevlar, sorry. Kevlar or carbon fibre. I have carbon fibre. But I'm not your regular average Joe that has, the, you know, that just has all this stuff. I also have a massive giant bit of tungsten and some other weird alloys. Um, what what composites do we have? It's changing our lives. All right, yeah. As well as other important advancements. Or oh, other important advancements. If you're going to do the spiel, then say what they are. That might make the Scotch yoke possible in modern times. In modern times, it's game changing it's going to revolutionize blah 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 bullshit 